There are things that go bump in the night. They are whispers in the shadows. Whispers of movies that would push the human psyche to its very limits. Where ghosts and ghouls are scared to roam. And the name that no one is brave enough to mutter. Well, good movies. Every Halloween, the orchestrator of fear, David Oscar, looks for those who will join the circus of hell. Will it be you? Oh, welcome to well, <laughs> welcome to well good movies the podcast that gives you the movies hellishly worth watching especially when there's bumps along the way i'm david osgar brought to you straight from the one-stop shop for evil hosts and i'm joined by my cursed co-host who comes with a free froget it's craig mcdonald hello craig that's bad <laughs> oh no i wasn't even just doing the simpsons reference i was just or that entire bit i was just passing condemnation god damn it i was gonna say but you get your free choice of topping <laughs> oh that's good <laughs> <laughs> the toppings are also kissed so yeah craig uh how are you doing obviously last time we were talking all about halloween and what your opinions are on uh the season and horror films etc yeah uh, and now have you got more into the spirit of halloween have you had any specific spooky watches apart from this week's film I'm not sure how much this really qualifies as a full-on spooky watch, but I did watch this morning uh, the Muppets Haunted Mansion. Great choice, great choice. It was, yeah, it was, it was entertaining. It was fun. Uh, I'm, I'm still not happy with the new voice actor for Kermit, but that I thought, it, I thought it was really good fun. Uh, I know that David wouldn't like it because there's one element that has infil- infiltrated pop culture that I know that David despises. So, how did you feel about the screaming goat? Oh, I, I just said I've got a reason to watch this film, but I haven't seen it yet. Okay, so there's I will a be screaming watching. goat in it. But as soon as you said that, I thought there's a screaming goat. <laughs> <laughs> like a screaming goat based off like the, you know, the YouTube screaming goats. Like, yeah. Yeah. Whoa, man. Yeah, da- David is uh, a particular killjoy on that. It's the thing that ruined uh, for Love and Thunder for him. Mm, exactly. That they included the screaming goat. <laughs> wow, I still haven't seen it's, that, uh, so thanks for the heads yeah. up. For that. I mean, yeah, it's, exactly. it's it's great for me. What it's given me is an avenue of if I want to terrorize David in the middle of the night, I'll just send him voice notes, which is just the screaming goat. Well, I I think definitely in terms of the I don't know what else to say there, but yeah, that would be that would actually be my nightmare. But you you should have bad vibes from it, Craig, because it was in Hoobie Halloween. But yeah, the Muppets, you know, it is very wholesome, and I'm glad that they did a haunted mansion special, especially the fact that from what I've seen, Pepe seems to like have a bigger role in what. Oh, he has in yeah, recent the, years. The vast, majority, the vast majority of it is just Gonzo and Pepe just walking around. Yeah, well, that's good. But uh, yeah, a f- fellow or so the previous guest, Sam Summers, I was listening to his podcast, Disneyversity, and they were talking about the Muppets the other day. And uh, they mentioned, the, they even called it the bad Kermit. Oh. <laughs> they were talking about like a previous Muppets and they were saying like, oh, you know, this was when it was the good Kermit. And I was like, oh, that poor like current performer who plays him. But it, he had like, I mean, Steve he Whitmire, needs I think, learn. was it? He needs to learn, David. (laughs) But uh, yeah, Joe Richards would be very happy that we're talking about the Muppets on on this episode. But yeah, uh, that is definitely a watch that I need to get to. And uh, also, and I'm sure Nia would either tell me, yes, you need to get on this or would maybe agree. I don't know if she's watched it, but is it Over the Garden Wall? Is that the the one which people are always like? Yeah, it's very spooky. It'll get you in the the mood. Yeah, a lot of people I see every year are kind of like, 
yeah, go watch, like, perfect time to go watch this. So, and every time I see visuals from it, I'm like, this just looks so weird and disturbing. I, I do yeah. kind of have to yeah. check it out. If we're going to be talking weird and uh, weird and disturbing, the brand new series of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared has also started. That I probably, I will put off as long as what uh, as possible to watch, but I will inevitably watch it. Oh, I haven't seen that. I've, I've heard, again, great things about it. It's a like very surreal, surrealist. Mm. Yeah, it's been on my list for a while. Yeah. But uh, yeah, for everyone at home, if you haven't guessed already, we are joined uh, by one of our previous guests and uh, she hasn't managed to join us for a very long time. So we are very happy to have uh, her back and be able to catch up. Please welcome animator and producer Nia Alavisos. Hello, Nia. Hello. Hello, guys. Thank you for having me back. It's been like it's been like two years, I think. Right. It was two plus, maybe it's, it's two almost... years from like literally like it was like yeah. October 2020. Right. Um, I think we did like the noir episode, which was just in like the peak of like the first lockdown, maybe. Mm. So that was maybe just before. And we had like the end game special as well. I think we were on with James. Yes. But yeah, it's definitely been a good sort of year and a half since I can't believe since it. Then, I'm so. sorry it's taken me so long to come back, but I'm glad I'm here today. So thank you for inviting me back. No problem. Yeah, we're glad to have you back. And yeah, it just means there's more for us to catch up on. And uh, yeah, so let us know you know what, what have you been up to what are some of the fun uh projects you've been working on uh obviously even way back then you were sort of teasing us about stuff and there's still stuff now probably you can't discuss in the world of animation but um yeah i'm sure you've been up to lots of fun stuff uh in both your work and your outside projects and what do you also think of some of the animation that's come out in in the last or two years mm, yes well like two years ago i was probably teasing the hammer and bolter series that sun and moon is currently working on for games workshop so it's like a 2d adult anime series so we've been working on that for like two years but on the side um i've been producing some animated shorts through film cymru one is a stop motion film that's still in production which is hoping to wrap around april time it's called Imenit. and the second one is a 2d um uh, animated film called Spectre of the Bear, which is also in production and will be finishing around the like March next year. Um, and then there's a few other projects that I can't really announce at the moment, but I hope I can let you guys know soon that I've I've been like a part of and like developing and stuff. And like one includes like potentially directing and writing as well. Ooh. Yes. That's the fun thing recently. Yeah, we've had so many like filmmakers, etc. on there's lots of people being like, oh, I'm going to be doing this. So I won't be able to say what it is now. So uh, yeah, if uh, if you're joining us again soon, it's just fun that we get to have those like updates as it goes along, which is which is always fun. But, uh, but even in this circumstance, like I said, there's just lots to catch up with even after, like you said, almost two years, etc. And I think also recently were you at uh, like one of the anime festivals in Cardiff as well, was it? Yes, I'm part of the crew who helps run a Cardiff Animation Festival. So that was in like April. And that was like the first time that they were back in chapter for like two years because at the start of the pandemic, uh, they were going to have the festival there. But you know how that turned out and stuff. So it was nice being able to participate, at least for me, first time, the yeah Cardiff Animation Festival. So it was awesome. And then this past weekend, I was also at a Kotatsu Japanese Animation Festival also at chapter so it was just really nice and and as you said because it you know this has been you know a big time for animation in you know some ways good some ways bad in terms of the fact that some things have maybe not had their theatrical releases because of covid etc but i guess a lot more people have had like access to certain animated films and there was a lot of projects that were kind of like in the pipeline that maybe got delayed but then we saw got to see all at once uh, things like Mitchell's versus the machines, you know, the fact that that was on Netflix, so a lot more people had access to it. And I think something like Spider-Verse kind of like has led to a lot more variation in animation. So today we'll be talking about stop motion, which is something completely different. But even when I was watching that, I was like, it's crazy to think, even when I was watching today's film, I was thinking that that was in 2012. And, you know, I guess we would have respected it more then especially because there wasn't that variety within 3D animation as there is now. So, you know, is there any standouts for you, Nia, that have been in like the last two years, whether it be your bigger companies like Disney or, you know, some of your smaller studios? Yes, uh, that's a great question. You didn't mention Mitchell's vs. Machines and that one I had no idea about. So when I watched it on Netflix, I was again, like just floored with like the story and like the type of animation that you saw in it. So that's something that stood out to me. But I've been watching more series work. Like, have you guys seen Arcane on Netflix? Yes. Like, the, like, Love Arcane. Yeah, they use like Blender 
um, on that. And they experimented with like the animation styles. They had like unlimited schedule and like budget, which is like what I've read. So they've been able to like take their time, which like really killed me. I was like, you know, a producer, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, but that's <laughs> something that like st- has like recently stood out to me. And I've like gone back and like rewatched it just a few times with like the, yeah, the technology and the animation uh, on that one. Somebody uh, said to me once they had watched it, they were kind of like behind in terms of having to watch through it. But once they did, they said, you know, you could take almost any frame of that and put it on the wall. It's that kind of like beautiful in terms of some of its animation. And I think that makes sense now that you said that, because I do think like, how could they have this much creativity and this much freedom? And yeah, I guess that that, that's the kind of results you have when when you're allowed that. And I think it, it comes through in everything, isn't it? Like the music, the voice work also benefits from just how much fun and freedom everyone has on the entire production mm, yeah and even in something like mitchell's versus machines you can tell like they put so much care into like every frame every like line of the character and like every background it's just like it was amazing and like the different sort they like blended like different types of animation in that film which i really, really appreciated but it was a lot of fun to watch Uh, Let's now get to uh, what led us to talking about today's film. Uh, So, Craig, uh, can you catch us up on uh, not just the last episode, but the last few episodes? We'd like to do these sort of like smaller recaps for how uh, we've been going for the sort of past five episodes. And uh, yeah, what led us to talking about today's film and what is today's movie? So we start off with the incredibly... A uh, beautiful cinematic, but utterly pointless and dull film, Avatar. Yeah, I'm going to get in that one last stab because I can uh, hate the <laughs> film. Um, I'm with you. Obviously, obviously, then that brought us into uh, leading on to the fact of not only like different minority voices involved in the film, but also the sequel being The Way of Water brought us into The Shape of Water. Uh, there where we discussed uh, a lot of the like sort of monster and romance influences uh, taking the uh, taking the connection of Sally Hawkins brought us into Paddington, uh, and obviously because of that, having our summer break, we already knew that the film that Paddington would lead us would be into Paddington Two. Um, so no surprises there. What was a surprise was the addition of the British aspect of filmmaking, plus Brendan Gleeson bringing us from Paddington Two into Twenty Eight Days Later. Um, Such a massive, massive culture shock. But as this is Halloween, uh, brought us into yet another sort of uh, Halloween-related film this week, but with an animation focus where we discuss Paranorman. Awesome, yes. So, yeah, this week we're discussing Paranorman, uh, the stop-motion film from 2012. Now, Craig, uh, we talked there at the top about uh, films that are hellishly... Uh, worth watching uh, and hoping for bumps along the way when it comes to our horror stuff. Uh, So just to tease the audience at home, can you uh, tease us as to your thoughts on the film before we uh, chat all about it between all of us? I mean, I genuinely want to bump you on the head for making me uh, talk about this film. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm very much going to be in the minority on this episode about this film. Um, So I'm ready. Yeah, that's, that's fun. (laughs) Yeah. We sharpen right. the pitchforks. <laughs> I look forward to hearing your thoughts. That's what it's about. I, 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 do, I don't. Oh, uh, fair enough. As in my own thoughts, not your thoughts. I, just want to I was about to clear. see myself out. I, yeah, Craig was just going to leave right there. <laughs> yeah, that'd be that'd be great for being a co uh, co host on the podcast. You're just like, you know what? I don't care what you guys say. <laughs> I don't. I just don't care. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> no, I don't look forward to hearing my thoughts on the film. I should clarify. Mm. Uh, well. That's uh, quite the tease there. So, uh, well, we'll uh, get to get to Craig's thoughts and uh, mine and Nia's thoughts on Paranorman. And we'll also be discussing whether it deserves uh, the honour of gaining a place in our movie vault, our vault that uh, highlights chosen films for all time. Meet Norman. Can't you be like other kids your age? His parents don't get him. He's probably up there fiddling with his Ouija or his orb. Harry. His sister doesn't like him. You are such a loser. And the kids at school. Look, it's Ab Norman. Always pick on him. But he does have some friends. Norman, wait up. I like to be alone. So do I. 
Let's do it together. It's just that most of them Good morning. aren't exactly alive. How's it hanging? <laughs> Haven't heard that one before. Do you see ghosts like all the time? <laughs> Who's a good boy? Uh, that's not his chin. <laughs> oh, 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 oh! Oh, couldn't you use another stall? Time is running out. From the makers of Coraline. The witch's ghost is going to wake up tonight. And when she does, she'll raise the dead. You've got to use your gift of talking to the dead to stop it. This is crazy. Do I look crazy to you? I want to give that a few minutes. Now, to save his time, he'll need a little help. Oh, yeah. I got you. Oh, this is getting completely out of. Is he dead or what? So, Paranorman was released, as I said, in 2012. Um, it is about a misunderstood boy who takes on ghosts, zombies, and grown-ups to save his town from a centuries-old curse. Uh, This film is directed by Chris Butler and Sam Fell and was written by Chris Butler. Uh, Previous saw credits uh, mainly on the Laker stuff, so this film is made by Laker Studios, uh, which has kind of made a name for itself in terms of their own projects, all being stop motion, uh, the ones that he's worked on, and some of the, the most famous ones, I guess, being... This Paranorman, uh, Missing Link, which was the most recent one a few years ago, uh, Kubo and Two Strings, and then, of course, Coraline, uh, which he worked on the art department uh, for. Uh, So in terms of your cast, then, you've got quite a big uh, sort of voice cast here, uh, a lot of well-known names from uh, the industry of acting and animation, etc. You've got Cody Smith-McPhee voicing Norman. Uh, Then you've got Tucker Al Brizzy voicing Neil. You also got Anna Kendrick who voices Courtney uh, Babcock, which is Norman's sister. Uh, you got Casey Affleck, which voices Mitch. You got Christopher Mintz Plas who uh, voices Alvin, and then uh, also along for the ride you got Leslie Mann, Jeff Garlin, Elaine Stritch, uh, Bernard Hill, and any other standouts? Oh, of course, uh, John Goodman as well, uh, who was Mr. Uh, Prendergast. Yeah, as I mentioned, this uh, being out in 2012, uh, kind of more of a, I guess some people would say, underappreciated sort of animated film, not up there with your kind of Disney, big, huge animations. But, you know, they have had a following over the years, especially thanks to the success with Coraline. And it does kind of go into that subcategory of horror and of animation in terms of being like a sort of creepy spooky themed animation which you don't tend to get as much as you do with things like musicals and fairy tales and fantasy etc so other similar films being frank and weenie Coraline, monster house nightmare before christmas etc so yeah it very much is within like a specific bracket for this film uh and a lot of its success you know, comes from the style of it and its influences, I guess. So, uh, Nia, we'll go to you first in terms of just talking about the kind of like style of animation or, and Laker itself, you know, if you had much experience with Laker, had you seen this film previously? What, what, what are your, your experiences with them as a studio? Yes. I love, is it like Laika? Laika might be, yeah, it might might be be potato, potato. (laughs) All right. I I was going to go with Laika, but... um, We'll go with Laika for the... I hope it's correct. I apologize if it's not. (laughs) I I really hope you're right as well, just because it means David is wrong. (laughs) Uh, I make no promises, though. But I love uh, Laika, I love Coraline, uh, Kubro and the Two Strings. um, So I'm very familiar with, like, the studio's work because they're, like, the only, like, stop-motion studio in America, really, at least, like, uh, contenders to, like, you know, Disney, Pixar and um and all that jazz uh so uh previously loved their work i loved paranorman i remember seeing that in cinemas when it came out um in uh, 2012 um so yeah i'm very familiar with it and i was glad because i haven't seen it for years so i was really happy that you guys picked it and i got to uh re-watch it recently and uh what would you say i think you know we maybe discussed this slightly before but obviously it was when we were talking about 3d animation because we were discussing the likes of dreamworks etc what is your experience with stop motion? You know, I know for yourself, you kind of 
your work means you're more involved in like 2D, 3D, but um, yeah, well, what's your history with stop motion and, you know, what, why do you think that that, you know, works so well as an animated medium? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm actually currently producing um, Erminent, which, which is a, a stop motion film um, by Laura Tolferides. So that was like, that uh, went into production around 2019, at the end of 2019. And unfortunately, it happened at the start of the pandemic. So that caused the film, you know, to be delayed for a few years and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's my first sort of experience dabbling with stop motion animation, very different from CG and 2D animation in regards to like the pipeline. Because as you guys know, stop motion is you have to build everything that you see on screen, literally everything that you see, every blade of grass and stuff. You have to build in the puppets. You have to build every sort of, you know, different face. And there's just a lot more that goes into it that you wouldn't expect, uh, which again, adds time and adds money and stuff. Uh, but I love this medium, like animation, you can do so much with it um, and like stop motion. Uh, yeah, I just love it. Um, and in case of like Leica um, uh, and Paranorman, they blended CG and stop motion, which you guys could tell a lot with like the ghosts and stuff and like that awesome scene at the end with like the witch and all her cool effects and stuff. So I thought that was an awesome opportunity to blend the two types of animation as well. And did you say previously that like uh, Ardman was kind of, was that like a sort of inspiration for you coming to the UK or that was kind of some of the work you originally wanted to do? Yes. Um, I was a huge fan of Ardman growing up uh, in America, you know, like Wallace and Gromit and Chicken Run and all that stuff. So that was one of the studios that I really yeah, respected and inspired me and stuff and motivated me to move out uh, to the UK. But there's so many other great studios here in the UK as well. So it's, yeah, it's all about discovering that talent and stuff but yeah you think of stop motion Leica, Ardman, and it's like maybe stupid buddy studios but that's like a very small studio in los angeles that does like robot chicken i'm not sure oh, if you guys yes. are familiar with that yeah yeah, yeah no this we are very sketches. familiar with nice. robot chicken fun fact i worked on the captain underpants the epic tales of captain underpants and i got to visit stupid buddies because we did a little stop motion um thing it was very like a dumb segment in the Captain uh, Underpants with like a ninja and stuff. It was really fun. Ah, uh, that's fun. Yeah, you, I guess you do get that a lot in animated films as well. Sometimes it's that like different styles will like cross over if they go into, I don't know, transport into a television or something like that. Um, dreams, things like that happen. One that I was thinking of as well in terms of like British, you know, obviously you've got Ardman, which sort of is very much dominates the kind of stop motion stuff. Um, but not so much kind of like British, but um, obviously friends across the sea in terms of Irish animation studio, which is Cartoon uh, Saloon, which, you know, uh, I think kind of fits the same sort of vibe in that they maybe not the most kind of top grossing animated films, but they can like Leica, they consistently kind of bring these kind of niche interests in stories, which are obviously got a fan base, I think. Yes, forgive me. They did The Secret of Kels. The, that's the... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Wolf Walkers, yes. I think, was the reason one. Yeah, I appreciate how they just sort of raise the bar within themselves. Like you can tell, like they just want to tell, you know, these stories. So it's like maybe it won't be as successful at the box office. But I appreciate them turning out original stories with like different characters and designs and stuff rather than cookie cutter, boring sort of Disney Pixar that you you know, which I'm kind of bored of at the moment. And I guess the kind of aim i suppose with some of these smaller studios is at least to get that kind of oscar nomination which i think is then unfortunate when they don't obviously win but maybe a lot of their success can be attributed to that so they can say well we haven't made this much money or maybe not originally but maybe that oscar nomination has kind of boosted them so you've seen wolf walkers cartoon saloon nominated within the awards you i think uh, Leica has been as well with you know missing link etc so they have got that kind of industry respect and that to kind of base some of their success on and i think as you were i thought it was interesting as you said earlier is that the fact that like is the only kind of american stop motion studio because previously i guess well i don't know if there ever was one but i guess my only kind of experience would be something like nightmare before christmas but it's almost as if 
then the Aardman style, which very much embraces even kind of like the fingerprints and stuff like that, it has a very sort of clay feel to it. And it kind of takes on the British charm and that kind of stories which are set in the countryside and all that kind of stuff. Whereas Light Guy, I suppose, is not as kind of round and kind of as organic in a way. I guess they have more of a, like you said, a kind of a physical feel to it in terms of like, hair and material and that blend of 3d as well like i especially think with kubo and the two strings that i think even i think it went more into missing link but i think the company i worked uh worked for actually had a slight link into being able to talk about this because there was like 3d printing used for missing link in terms of they were printing like using a certain software to to print pieces that were used for that film and i guess that that's the kind of difference is that Ardman would be there kind of like molding something whereas they're kind of like cutting and printing and using all different sort of textures and stuff like that nice yeah and i think well one of my um trivia things for later that i'm just going to mention now because you mentioned 3d printing uh paranorman is the first stop motion film to utilize a 3d printer to create you know all the replacement faces uh for its puppets and stuff so yeah i thought that was interesting that you yeah brought up 3d printing and what is interesting with the physical aspect as we were talking there, I think, because again, like is very good at being kind of celebrating its, its success as well. Like what I loved in Missing Link, Missing Link and uh, Kubo did it as well. I can't remember if the other ones have done it, but they usually show you in the credits the kind of like how it was made and they show the transition and the kind of like fast motion of them sort of piecing everything together. And I think that when you've had that with Kubo, you can see how like huge that monster that he fights was and you can see how like massive the the, like this uh sort of skull creature that he comes across at one point like that is massive and they're literally like so whilst gromit sometimes you might see and you're like oh they're actually bigger than i thought but some of the models and stuff they're working with in these films are like huge sets which are really impressive so i think that's something that's always sort of stood out to me with them as well is their kind of scale um and yeah, their attention to detail, which would come from stuff like that, but it's stuff that they're able to kind of complement with with visual effects as well. Yes, yeah, I agree. It's always my favorite part, just seeing like all the sets like laid out and stuff, and you see like the animators like walking through the sets, like they're like giants and stuff. Yeah. Did you see? Um, they're quite like I said they're quite good on social media as well in terms of being like, oh, you know, flashback to when we were making this or showing behind the scenes videos which I've never seen before. And I think there was one recently, obviously, because it is Halloween and you know, that's why we're talking about Paranorman and that's probably why they're bringing it up on their channels. But I think one of the animators who worked on Paranorman, sometimes they'll revisit kind of characters and do like little animations with them for the internet or something like that. And they, um, he was animating Norman again and he like got really emotional and choked up about it. I thought it was really sweet. The fact that he was just like, oh, I'm revisiting Norman and this was my character. And the fact that when he said like, I'm able to bring him back to life again, I can kind of like interact with him in a different way. Maybe because you said like of new technologies or ways in which they work. I just thought that was such a nice aspect, which is obviously something that you would get with Ar- Ardman, etc. But not something you would get even with a drawing on a page. Well, to an extent, I suppose you'd get with a drawing on a page, but those are still several pages and that character sort of represents that one thing on that page that excitement they're laughing and then when you look at 3d animation that's kind of like a 3d model but there's still the screen between you is stop motion like they have the puppet there and like he kind of you know the the character is there right in front of them which i thought was a nice aspect to have yeah i think that's great yeah like you said you have like the physical puppet you get to hold in your hand and like they probably spent so much more time being with those characters and animating them, you know, frame by frame. So I, yeah, I can understand getting emotional. Just so yeah, like revisiting, you know, an old friend and stuff. Mm. Yeah. That's uh, very, very sweet to see that kind of stuff. Um, and I, yeah, I guess that kind of like overlaps into, you know, the, the visuals, the animation, uh, is there anything that stands out to you specifically near with Paranorman when you think of that? Because obviously, like I said, it's evolved since Kubo, uh, since Paranorman with things like Kubo and Missing Link. Um, but do you think there's anything so more unique with this one as opposed to other films they've done? Or I think with this one, the, the thing that's like most unique is how I think, I, like I said before, they sort of merge stop motion and 3D animation. So you get like the really amazing ghost effects. Like you wouldn't have been able to do that without, you know, blending visual effects 3d animation and stuff and i just thought it looks so seamless just the ghost floating there 
and how they handled the witch, the bit at the end, like the fight scene. And then when she's talking to Norman and she has just like that white, yellow energy and like that i just thought they did such a great job and that's what stood out to me a lot um you know aside from the amazing character designs um and the sets and stuff and it's like a small detail but i really liked norman's big ears and how the light would sort of shine through his ears it's like very like small like little touch but i really appreciated just like the little things and his hair this his hair is just like so so perfect yeah exactly i, I suppose that goes into the style isn't it of of Leica, uh, Leica, sorry. Um, like Craig, am I right in thinking the missing link there might be the only one you had previously seen before this? Cause I know we yeah, saw that's it right. in cinema. Mm. So did you kind of have like an, a kind of idea of their type of films just from that one of like what the general gist is or the style or. Yeah. I mean, I'm also not completely media tone deaf. I've obviously seen a lot of sort of clips about Coraline, etc. So I very much had an idea of what they were go what they were going for. And yeah, as I said earlier, in terms of like having that style with Ardman and that being very British, do you think that there is a kind of do, do you think that they kind of represent American animation well? Do you think that they do? What what is it about their style? Do you think that the Leica style is there? What is you know I I said what I kind of thought it might be is the kind of material the the hair and the you know that 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 kind of look do you, to you when you think of like a Leica film do you have a certain image in your mind and and what do they kind of like represent yeah I think it um it stands with like you know so her, sort of like Pixar when like the art challenges the technology that you always heard like John Lasser said but I just think that's like the very American thing at least with like animation you kind of see like uh, constantly raising the bar with whatever technology they're using at the time or trying to tell you know like the most it's not like risky story, but like this is like a children's film about, you know, like zombies and, you know, turning against people and stuff. So, yeah, just and there's there's like guns in this one, too. So I would say that's very American. Right. Uh, no, but it's just <laughs> constantly. Pushing. I'm glad you brought that up to be fair. I was just like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, how can you not? Um, no, but it's just, um, yeah, I, I attribute it to just constantly raising the bar and very competitive, too, I would say, because they're just trying to like be on you know on the same table with like i said disney pixar and all those bigger studios dreamworks and stuff i don't know if you guys realize it or like notice it you know watching over here from the uk or if it yeah do you guys notice like anything different with Leica compared to stuff like um Ardman? Well, i think interestingly it's kind of like they almost seems like especially with like the box trolls one there's that kind of like british influence almost there as well whereas when i think again of something like nightmare before christmas then i don't look at that and think like oh there's clearly like influences from any kind of like british culture or like stories or anything there and i guess that kind of goes into paranormal is that idea of whereas like 3d animation tends to be more kind of like modern there's you know like 2d animation tends to kind of like take stories from the past because there's something quite historic and kind of nostalgic about having that 2d look and i guess the 3d uh, sorry i guess the stop motion kind of embraces that in terms of not necessarily having the past or the future but kind of embellishing these certain types of stories because they kind of match well with the style so i think that while ardman has done that for very specific kind of british stories chicken run classic example of that um you know, farming chickens, pies, all of that kind of stuff. They're, you know, they're out in the countryside. Whereas, you know, the, the box trolls maybe is the kind of like outsetter to that. But I guess it kind of fits with what you were saying is that kind of Pixar approach, Disney approach of being like, well, let's go for um, a story set in this land or this world, especially with something like Kubo or Missing Link in which they're trying to show different cultures. Because I guess, you know, America is more of a, you know, a melting pot, as people have said, of different cultures. But but like you said also is that I do get that idea of leveling up as Pixar's done in the past, of kind of seeing that, you know, upgrade each time and seeing how they can push the boundaries. Um and I think that the the history element is interesting is the fact that obviously America hasn't got as deep a history as a lot of countries, but that's maybe where a lot of the kind of spooky Salem y stuff like influence a lot of stories because that that is some of the oldest history or some of the most interesting history that america has so it you know it's it's kind of influenced almost you know 
two or three of these kind of stop motion films in a way. Yeah, that's fair. And also all the horror films that you see the film pays homage to are all like American horror films as well, like Night of the Living Dead and all that stuff. Yeah. And it kind of, I suppose, goes into, I think I heard like Ray Harryhausen mentioned as, you know, an influence on the zombie look. Mm. So I guess, again, that kind of like goes into the American filmmaking aspect of Clash of the Titans and all of those kind of films, which again, even though have, a, you know, their sort of British influences and everything like that, but, you know, somebody like Ray Harryhausen, who had a lot of involvement in, you know, Los Angeles and, you know, American filmmaking, etc. I suppose that that kind of old style has kind of influenced stop motion in that way as well. Yes, 100%. Look, I think it's just one of those things where it's very much a story. So it's very much a story trying to, you know, deal with the ways in which people react to, you know, being treated as an outsider, right? I I don't think anyone can sort of argue if that's the core premise of the film. Cool. We've all agreed on that. Here's why I just don't think for me it works because the message they necessarily go for, I think they, they necessarily try to create this one of just, you know, being being the bigger person and just not allowing yourselves to be sort of stooped down to the level of uh, to the level of the bully because of what's happened. The problem is I think that there's a way in which a lot of it comes off as one I think it's sort of the same issue I have with Chicken Little and a lot of people have with Chicken Little. I think that a lot of the film that has been set up is incredibly mean-spirited and just for me it sort of crosses over too much into that territory of just I do not see how it, some of these characters can necessarily come back. And even this core message of just oh people do horrible things but they don't mean to be horrible. I'm just yeah but n- no no you need to show to some extent that these people at least get and understand that and even just for me, it felt like even though, uh, even though the Puritans who obviously sentenced the girl to to execution back in the days of uh, back in the days of the of the uh, witch trials, even though they say their actions were just wrong, it still didn't feel like they had actually done anything significantly to atone for their actions, especially with the girl. So, ex- so for me, it just I got this message of just, you know, oh, you just need to sort of move on and accept that these things are happened. And I'm just like, as somebody who's gone through a lot of crap in my life with regards to a lot of people, even quite even quite recently, I just think that's a relatively terrible message. Um, and even if it's not what the me- it, message the film wanted to necessarily portray, that is what it's come across as. And I think even to... Like, I, I even had to look up this opinion online because I was like, I can't be the only person who thought this. And and while the, the majority of the uh, of the uh, reviews for this film are positive, uh, there are people who sort of do latch onto this idea of just the messaging about, sto- uh, the messaging about like bullying is sort of problematic and just there are elements with, with the story that can be read like that. And I just, I just couldn't look past it. I just got to this point of just, even to the end of the film where, uh, with the group that he had hung around with sort of did defend him within, against the mob, I did question, why have you come around this easily? I I never saw any of the moments where they actually sort of, you know, grew and necessarily a, a sort of atoned and have that discussion. So for me, it just, it felt like a lot of our sort of redemption rang hollow. And even the dad, I thought, was just unnecessarily jerkish. Um, so yeah. I just found this film incredibly unpleasant to watch. Not to mention the fact that when you also mix in like the character designs, which are meant to look, you know, quite out there and different. um, It just created an atmosphere which made it very hard for me to come back. And even though I I really love like the emotional impact and the animated beauty of the ending, frankly, I was just pissed. I was, I just got to the end and I was just pissed. So, yeah. That is how the film made me feel. I was going to say, like, I think, like, at this point, Nia is going to be, like, the mediator in the book. And how did that make you feel? <laughs> mm. Yeah, you're not wrong, though. Because, yeah, that was, that was like, one of my thoughts still. Um, even when I watched it at the start, like, the characters are very just, like, one-dimensional. And you don't see them grow at all. And then they suddenly, there's, like, a... And then they change. And they're like, yeah, man, Norman's so cool. But you just don't see that. You don't see them 
realize that moment to be like, dang, I shouldn't have treated him, you know, like this and, and stuff. And like his dad too, being like, you did it, son. I was like, but huh? That was just so random. It's the worst, worst dad in cinema history, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely had those kind of like problems as well, I think. And like Craig said, I think that it kind of jumped to them defending it. And I think sometimes I can kind of forgive it more in some of your animated stuff in which they're on like a smaller time frame. And I think visually, sometimes you can get stuff across. Uh, and yeah, this very, and it, it's funny just because and one of the films that I thought of when watching this, and I know then Craig would understand and sort of agree with me in this sense, um, and especially as you mentioned earlier, Nia, you were saying about, you know, you've been disappointed by Pixar and I guess that, you know, I, I've been, you know, generally okay with them. I've, I found myself disappointed in one or two of the, you know, recent projects, but, um, my least favorite Pixar film. And, you know, I think that is because it's very much down the same road of just like, I don't agree with this message. And I think that this is really horrible is the good dinosaur. I think that, but in my mind, I was like, at least I was kind of justifying Paranorman a bit more in the sense of like, well, this is what this is doing better than the good dinosaur in the sense of at least I felt that uh, Norman wasn't doing anything. Well, you know, I, I didn't feel that Norman was doing anything to kind of prove himself. It was more a justification of like, no, I was right to kind of be the person I was all along kind of aspect rather than the whole kind of like at the end, like you did it, son, you finally managed to prove your worth kind of thing, which, you know, is just, yeah, like a needlessly like pushy parent kind of message to, to send, which I, I don't feel that this film did. It did in the sense that the dad was a dick, but I didn't feel that the film went with, oh, I need to like prove my dad right kind of thing. So No, no, no. What I'm saying is the message is just, yes, your dad is going to be a dick, but the response is not uh, to hate your dad. It's to see that he's actually trying to help you. So it's not you're trying to prove yourself to your dad. It's your dad is going to do some like horrible, horrible things, but eh, let it go yeah that was like the mom the mom being like yeah he doesn't understand you you know he's just Which he then confused. literally yeah. repeats to the girl who's had of what a 300 year curse because mm. she was sentenced to death for what being able to talk to ghosts that like i said that's the interpretation that i just had and just yeah it, it just brought it brought back a lot of things mm. no you are right that that and like you said i don't think that it does yeah that messaging is wrong when it came across i was like very much hindering like what her response was going to be like what the mum's response and i was kind of like expecting the worst and then glad that she was kind of like going down the line of like oh he's just like scared for you kind of thing and they didn't kind of like justify it in a more like idiotic kind of way so i was kind of able to kind of let it pass a bit more but yeah i definitely agree i think that it doesn't kind of bring the dad character around enough by the end. And even if you think of something which we recently talked about with Paddington, there wasn't an element of like, oh, well, you see why the father used to be a nice guy and maybe now why he's become this kind of cagey kind of man. They're not doing any of this kind of like showing why why the mother might have got together with him or forgive his actions in the first place. Because Paddington does a very good job of kind of going, well, why would this woman be with this man? And you then see, oh, right, okay, he's changed. He has become this person and now the other characters make it very clear that that's not a cool thing to do. And this is not a cool way to be to this character, which they don't do in this film. It was also just really awkward where towards the beginning of the film, he's he just asserts that he's quite liberal. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> really? Yeah. Why? <laughs> that's never a good. It's like it's like I'm quite liberal when it comes to these things. It's like that's that's usually what somebody who's about to say something quite horrific is going to mm. say. And then he goes, but all this hippie stuff is like, there you go. And the fact that like he made some comment about his wife being from like, is it from like LA or something like that? He was just like, oh, well, I don't know. Where it's different over from where you were from. And I was just like, I was like West Coast, this yeah. Yeah. I was like, you're not painting this character in the best light of him just like ragging on his wife in that way. I was just like, why are you being so mean to her? And again, I think other films do a lot better job of, uh, you know, like, the fact that at the end of the film or something, a character might go, you know what, screw you, you know, we don't need you or something like that. Like they actually, you know, exile them from a family or, you know, say that you are a dick. Also, I don't know whether it's just because I also, I've also just watched other sort of older properties depicting sort of like high school life uh, today. So I've just been, just had an overflow of just 
ridiculously stereotypical bully characters. But I've I've just decided I'm genuinely sick of any property that has a bully that will just bully someone but do ridiculous things that if the person that they were bullying were doing, they would hence bully them for. I'm just like, I I want to write a fiction at some point where somebody tries to bully someone it's just like, oh, you're going to talk to ghosts, are you? And just be like, who talks like that? Like, what? Are you, what's wrong with you to talk like that? Did, would you like me to refer you? Because my God, just how does nobody clap back in these films and just be like, shut up? It sickens me. And just also he goes to that weird troop. It's just like, next time I see you, you're dead. It's like, chill it down. It reminded me a bit of, um, is it Ron's, Ron's Gone Wrong, which I randomly watched at Christmas, which I think was possibly like, was it like an, oh no, was it an overhang of blue sky or something like that? I think it ended, it's Locksmith, was... Locksmith animation. Ron's okay, Gone wa- but... Wrong? Yeah, but it was still kind of, it was on Disney Plus or something like that because maybe it was 20th Century Fox was distributing it or something. So it kind of became a Disney release picture in the sense oh, that... Yeah, that was a, made a, a definitely, yeah. For, oh. It's definitely on Disney Plus though. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that goes down a similar route of like showing the typical like bully children and, you know, this American high school kind of vibe, um, which again, you know, I suppose in my mind, I was just like, oh yeah, you know, typical family friend you know family film animated. family friendly, friendly. No, wrong way to <laughs> typical family movie uh animated kind of route to go down but as you said i think there would be other pros which i would bring up which kind of then makes up for some of the flaws that you mentioned there craig and i would agree with most of them on the one that does remind me of very much though in terms of the theming especially and i know like this will just cause you to go like oh god you know in terms of where we've had that divide before is and i don't think it's exactly the same but is uh the way way back (laughs) this just reminded me a lot of that in just terms of the kind of like overly harsh characters and like one of us having an issue more with like oh well why you know you don't justify and it's kind of like more isolated character who sort of is emboldened by the end it just reminded me a lot of our kind of divide on that in terms of the reactions yeah what this is really saying is just you are the you are the childhood unlike anything i had to endure (laughs) (laughs) Uh, that's where i was like nia is just like and how did it make you feel (laughs) yes like tell us more about that experience (laughs) (laughs) but but, uh I mean, it's ironic. Despite being host of a podcast, I don't think people want to hear me speak. No, yeah, talk it out. That's how it helps. I know. Last time as well, we were talking about Halloween. Craig was talking about when people threw eggs at him. So yeah, this this, Halloween is definitely bringing up some bad bad memories. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm just going to start the next episode of this of this podcast crying. Oh, Oh. just out of just out of nowhere. (laughs) That's okay. You gotta let it out. That's all right. There's no shame. So um. Nia, uh, it's very hard to sort of pick up from that in terms of like trying to move on, but no, let's go okay. for it. Um, so what are your general opinions of the film? Um, d- obviously, I assume from kind of what you said that maybe some of the pros outweigh the cons for you, but w- what do you generally think? Um, yeah, I generally, I generally like enjoy the story, but yeah, like I said, um, it's just like the characters fell flat. So there really isn't much depth to the story, but I appreciate how they made a twist at the end. So you assume it's like big bad witch going out to get everybody and all, you know, and these zombie characters um, rising from the ground are going to like eat everyone. But then you realize they're trying to get Norman to help, you know, so I really appreciated that sort of twist. And they're trying to get him, you know, to put the witch back to sleep. And then the also the other twists of the townspeople attacking the zombies, which I thought was actually hilarious. Um, as well, like the zombies were more afraid of the townspeople than the townspeople were afraid of the zombies. So I, um, I appreciate there's like the little things that they would change in the story, um, like that. Um, and I also sort of enjoyed how they put this in a children's film, you know, like a, um, a child being murdered, you know, from like the Salem witch trials and stuff. And that was a pretty like big deal to showcase. Um, so I appreciate the risks that they took in that regard. But I also um, agree that, you know, the whole bullying thing could have been handled a bit better and not so like stereotypical. But I guess that's like an American thing because, you know, that's like all you see in like the high school dramas yeah. and stuff. 
I was gonna say, do you know, does is it different for you? Do, do you think it kind of depicts American high school experience accurately or Yeah, with like the whole yeah, yeah. Everyone always like yeah, would treat like, you know, like the quote unquote weirder kids like you know, like that. Like I was bullied like a few times as well because I was a bit like weird. You know, obviously I don't talk to ghosts and stuff, but I've experienced <laughs> that too. And it's just like It's fine if you do talk to ghosts, Nia. We're we're gonna There's no there's no shame in know. talking to ghosts. Ghosts are nice. No. Yeah. You know. But it's just sort of, they have to just exaggerate it for, I don't understand why, but just to make the bully just do outrageous things, which again, always pisses me off, but. Yeah, this is, yeah, it's definitely an open space. Everyone's just like talking oh, yeah, about past sure. traumas from, from this film is bringing yeah. up, but I think <laughs> the general school experience, some, you know, is, is quite often quite universal, but obviously there's things that are very specific to America, things like cheerleaders and that kind of stuff yeah, but um, yeah, i'm sure that yeah yeah like speaking of um oh my gosh i forgot the character's name again mitch is bro mitch, yeah mitch being like the you know the super jock and then norman's sister being like the you know preppy popular girl and you know so there are those like tropes and those stereotypes that you would you know attribute to like american high school stuff yeah i think and i suppose that's where you know, that element is like the, the character stuff and how you relate to them. And also the, what we've discussed many times, especially when me and Craig might have different opinions is the kind of like style over substance aspect in which I can give stuff a bit more, um, credit for certain aspects of the film, but also just maybe kind of ideas and stories that I kind of get excited by a bit more. I think with this film, it was very much one in which, like we said last week with 28 Days Later, it was kind of like the core of the idea and the strength of that was very much at the start of the film. Whereas again, this I feel is kind of like at the end. And I think that often that then leaves you kind of coming out on a high as opposed to being like, oh, that's too bad that that kind of like drifted off. So I think that in my mind then, Paranorman, I had a lot better experience with. Obviously, whereas if I had kind of stopped halfway through, then I would have been like, eh, you know, it's just kind of standard animated fear. And I felt that, you know, throughout in some ways, especially the characterization and the way that the story was going. And I think uh, Leica does have this tendency to kind of have a more slower, sort of gentler approach. They they don't do the kind of Pixar of like Toy Story 3, like, woo, big, massive, like imaginary toy sequence at the beginning and there's a train falling over a bridge and this kind of stuff. They always tend to kind of start it off a bit more like gentle and then it kind of builds up to the more crazy stuff later on and i think that that can kind of hold them back in somewhat of a sense of especially now when you're looking at these days of like does it deserve to go on streaming does it is it a theatrical experience and i think by the end it definitely justifies that but at the beginning maybe not so much but not to say that i think that any animated film should be seen on the big screen but i think that is just an element that other people will see when they're kind of watching something as opposed to home to on the cinema and I think that for me, I, yeah, I just enjoyed like a lot of the humor, um, some of the performances and some of just, yeah, the, the story aspects of the film. And I think while, yeah, Craig didn't enjoy the kind of like feel like the themes of the isolation and bullying, et cetera. And yeah, I agree that I think that it's very typical, you know, why is this person picking on this person and sort of hammering that home with everyone doesn't like them. But again, I think there's been so many other examples in which I've seen it sort of handled like overly much. And especially in the example of that Ron's Gone Wrong film, in which I think a lot of films then kind of make it more unbelievable. Because even though that character might be kind of like very reserved and nerdy, they also have like loads going for them. Or especially in some of the like worst examples in which you're like, this kid's really cool. Why does nobody like them? You know, like the fact that they, they're they such a big character, if they are kind of Ryan Reynolds kind of person, that you're like, this doesn't make sense that everyone would pick on them because they're actually like a very awesome person, which I think hap happens quite often uh, with things like Disney films and stuff like that. So here I appreciated that, especially I think in, you know, who Norman was voiced by with Cody uh, Smith McPhee, he was the right person because I think that he brought that kind of like, sort of loner aspects to it and kind of like was very reserved and kind of didn't sort of like make him to be this like larger than life person so I really liked the scenes like when it was like him and the friend who were playing fetch and just the fact that he was so shy to be like oh no I, I can't do that I can't do that and I just thought it was like 
just a quite realistic moment and the fact that they kept him as this kind of shy reserved character and it wasn't the like oh i'm actually this amazing person at doing this that and the other it was just the fact that he was like the chosen one and he just had the you know good heart to actually go well have we ever questioned why this person is doing this in the first place and i guess that the story eventually kind of goes you know like you said i enjoyed as well near the fact that it says well, it's actually the townspeople who are the monsters and the zombies. And while I think that maybe comes in a bit late, they could have done that a bit sooner. Um, I think it still works to the success of of that third act. So, and, we, you know, we're talking about jokes and some of the themes that it brings up. I, even though, obviously, I can understand all the uh, thematic elements that Craig didn't enjoy, didn't enjoy, but I'm still surprised that he didn't at least forgive the film more for just having the line... Uh, you can't fire a gun at civilians. That's the police's job. I was like, oh yeah, I was like, that didn't age very well, did it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The fact that was done yeah. in 2012, I was like, oh my god, I, I can't know. believe this animated film just did said that. So wow. Yeah, but I just, you know, it's the American thing. She just like randomly pulls out a gun as well. You know, like from her back. Like I was like, oh, good grief. But it's also funny too. But I'm just like. It's it's yeah. Baseball. There's definitely obviously they're doing the political commentary mm. there, but it's even before some even worse stuff has happened since. So and it's obviously a bigger problem now in some ways, or it's become a bigger political point. So yeah, the fact that they were doing that and they literally had that character holding a gun to Norman's head, I was just like, they went there. Like you know, the, the fair play to them for actually making that clear because I think it is true in the sense of like the style of the the characters, etc. I wasn't scared by the zombies or I didn't think they looked horrific. I thought that blonde lady who like immediately got out the shotgun, she was the most horrific looking character in this film. A hundred percent. And like even the ghost grandma at the beginning, she kind of like foreshadows things in a way when she's like, you know, they could have resolved things if they just spoke to each other, you know, which is like the townspeople to the zombies and what Norman was trying to establish, you know, during like the whole mob scene and stuff. Um, but yeah, I just think that's like a really important thing, especially now. Yeah, for me, I think that's where the strength comes in is like, again, the dad stuff wasn't very well handled, but I did pick up on that line, which the grandma says, which is nothing, there's nothing wrong with being scared as long as you don't let it change who you are. I thought that was a great line. And I think that that very much comes true at the end of the film. So it's kind of like, if you focus on that bit and not just the kind of like, oh, the dad thinks he's a creep freak thing, like they could just taken the dad thing completely out of it, to be honest. Um, I think that that was more what they should have run with and they could have even you know there's the whole like show or tell somebody something three times to make a stick in their head they could have made a bigger emphasis on that whole like don't let fear change you because i think that that very much embodies norman the fact that when he's there telling the story at the end that's what i respected so much about it i was like this kid is just telling his story as well he's like there was this you know girl in town that nobody liked and everyone was scared of and the fact that that was just exactly what happened to him but it wasn't like overly done it wasn't like pushed in your face i thought i kind of just thought was refreshing and a great way of kind of circling the story in that way i really liked how norman didn't really yeah like you said change who he is and he's sort of stick to his guns and stuff because sometimes you have like the hero sort of like disappoint you as a viewer you're like oh my god you know saying something to his best friend and stuff but when they left him you know like alone in the library he was like okay fine i'll have to just do this myself because he's still he wants to protect everyone and he wants to help the town and the zombies and, you know, the witch and stuff. So I appreciate how he sort of stuck to his truth, even when no one believed in him and stuff. Yeah, definitely. And and as you said as well, is the fact that they're dealing with some very grim and dark subject matter. The fact that, you know, in this film, I made a note that there's the line, just the, the girl says, is this where they buried me? I was like, this is very grim and dark. Mm. You know, the fact that we are looking at like how a bunch of adults like kill the child and buried them and even the fact that earlier in the film is he has to get the book off the body of like his uncle is it and oh, i was just like yeah. <laughs> can we call an ambulance please and get this dead yeah, body, his body like, is collected? still there to this day no one has yeah. like come you know <laughs> i still think they tried to do that shot in a really in a bit of a comic way with the entire oh he's he won't let go of the book despite the fact he's dead and just all the angles that he did as opposed to something a bit more grounded so even though you respect the humor of this film uh i I personally didn't find a lot of the lines all that much funny. Um, I think there are just some things they tried to get like a little bit of humor out of, which I I think they should have just left. 
I I don't know. It's 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 weird. They in in that moment they made they just made the grimness feel just like sort of flippant and just unrespected. I don't know how to describe it. That's fair. There is that one scene with Mitch when um, he hits the guy, the zombie, and then he picks up his head and like that. Yeah, I can see what you mean as well. Yeah. I mean, the sort of like punting his head, I sort of like kind of expect from a film like mm. this. So that that didn't bother me. That didn't bother me too much. And it also makes sense for Mitch's character that he was just like, can you believe that? I know, that was so mad. Yeah, I got it like a hundred yards or whatever yeah. he says. Yeah, a lot of that is just stereotypical kind of stuff. I think like the comedy is kind of more like 50-50 with me, but I think it's sometimes where the style of the film works to its benefit. So there's times where I laughed out loud. There's times, like you said, Craig, where he was getting the book off him and it was very kind of like slapsticky kind of humor which i was just like uh you know this is just your typical kind of stuff of like oh no the body you know i am hitting its head against the wall and all that kind of stuff and even at the end when like the girl is like bashing him against the tree i was like is this really necessary oh yeah but, he was like borderline yeah. about to yeah pass out and yeah, stuff. yeah exactly but what did i think work in terms of the animation style was when john goodman's character it just really cracked me up when he was like had the book uh, and he like got back to like his house or whatever and he was like i'm gonna do this i'm gonna have to like uh show norman you know whatever and then he like starts coughing and then like it's just the way he's like because this is just the great thing with stop motion or whatever and they kind of do it in like the old 2d cartoons where somebody just goes like dead straight i just loved how he went like oh and then just like went flat and on the ground and then his ghost started come out and then he went no and then he like got into this like ball and he's like you're not gonna get me yet and then the fact he just died again immediately immediately yeah that was good that just cracked me up i did love that yeah i thought some comments were funny from uh neil neil's character he had some pretty funny moments you know like the bully was like i'll punch you in the boob and he was like they're pictorials i thought that was cute i thought i thought it was funny or when he was um watching like the aerobics video and it was like the freeze frame i was like that's funny come on yeah <laughs> yeah and he said he'll throw the hummus and it's spicy yeah, the hummus. i was like yes i can relate <laughs> can't waste the hummus so, yeah, I did like that he was, mm. again, he wasn't too much of a stereotypical character. And he was very open as well. Like, the fact that he was just like, oh, why do they bully you? Oh, because I have this. And the fact he was just like, I have IBS. And I was like, <laughs> I don't funny. think I've ever yeah. heard you in a film I ever say that. I was like, wow, okay. Yeah. He's very open. Um, so I kind of, yeah, just grew more of an attachment for the character in that sense. But also, again, it goes into Norman's thing. I'm glad that they didn't have them be best friends from the start because i think a lot of films do that in which they're like oh they're a loner they're a weirdo but they're in like a group of three people and you're like well are they they've still got their own friends and even though yeah that is a thing within school there's like a group of three of you and you stick together and everyone bullies all of you but the fact they were going with the loner isolated thing i think it was important that norman even tried to shut himself away from him and it wasn't until the end of the film that they actually became friends. I thought that was a good, like a nice touch. Oh yeah, with the in regards to, I think the only characters who have like any proper character development, the zombies. You know, like when the Norman and you know them were talking, and then he was like, "Why'd you do it?" You know, because I was scared. I mean, they probably had like hundreds of years, obviously, for this development. But that's like, I yeah, I did say no character development in this, but yeah, I would say the zombies probably the best character development. Yeah, I thought that was quite, but I liked the way that they kind of recognized that and when they went like, oh, it was because of this man and he's just like stood there like, yeah, I, I screwed up. I'm sorry. And yeah, I think that that's where the element and the theme of th fear works. But again, it was just so bad that they didn't apply that to the dad. You know, yeah, like that would, would be a nice perfect chance. Just to have a moment or some sort of change like with the dad. But yeah, it looks like, the, you know, back to like the zombie Puritans and stuff. It's just kind of like sad as well when they were sort of finally passing on and stuff and that you can kind of tell like the last ghost was sort of still regretting it as he sort of went away so i thought that that was good that was a good touch yeah i honestly expected more ghosts in this film i think that was the thing because there was ghosts and they were like you can speak to ghosts you need to use them to like use your power to overcome this i was like oh the, the ghosts didn't really come into it again afterwards like because yeah. at the beginning when you saw like i thought that scene was quite effective of how he's talking you see him talking to nothing and everyone's so you kind of understand maybe like why people are like, oh, he's a bit strange because you just see him talking to thin air, but then you see it from his perspective. And I thought that the fact that you've seen so many variety of ghosts, like literally like, you know, somebody in a parachute on a tree and a hippie, I was like, oh, these are going to come up again and they're going to have some fun uses of their abilities or something. I was like, oh, no, they just never appear again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Okay, so grab those cassettes and rewind them again because it's time for VHS Corner. In this week's episode, we asked Nia uh, to take us through some of the interesting uh, factoids and behind the scenes of this film. So Nia, over to you. Awesome. There are some I already mentioned, but I'll just repeat them again. So I got 13 facts for you guys. One, Paranorman is the first stop motion uh, film to utilize a 3D color printer to create replacement faces for its puppets. Two, over 31,000 individual face parts were printed for the production. Three, Mitch is the first openly gay character in a mainstream animated film. Uh, four, in 2013, Paranorman was the first ever PG-rated film nominated by GLAD in its annual GLAD Media Awards. Uh, number five, the bathroom sequence when Norman is contacted by the ghost of Mr. Prendergast took one year to shoot. Uh, number six, the idea of the film came from Chris Butler, who, realizing that zombie films often contain a degree of social commentary, thought making such a movie for kids could help express the challenges kids face growing up. Number seven, it took 18 carpenters, 18 model builders, six riggers, 12 scenic painters, 11 greens artists, and 10 set dressers to craft the movie's nearly three dozen unique locations. Uh, number eight, the story is set in the town of Blythe Hollow, whose name is a mashup of two other ghost stories, Noel, Noel Coward's Blythe Spirit and Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Number nine, Blythe Hollow was also directly inspired by Salem, Massachusetts, and the story itself from the Salem Witch Trials that took place in the 1600s. Number 10, Paranorman was the final film of Elaine Stritch before her death on July 17th, 2014. Uh, number 11, at the beginning of the film, Norman is uh, watching a scary movie, and the actress is actually modeled after Jamie Lee Curtis in 1978's Halloween. And the plot is a spoof of 1968's The Night of the Living Dead. And then two more. Um, Aggie bears a striking resemblance and similarity to Alessa Gillespie, I hope I said that right, from the Silent Hill franchise, and also both characters were portrayed by Jodel Furland. And the last one. It is implied that Norman and Agatha are very distantly related, most likely 11th cousins. And that's it. Which which one did you say was the one that took a year to make? What was the scene? Or? It, the bathroom scene, wasn't it? Yes, let me just hold on. Yes, the bathroom sequence um, when Norman is contacted by the ghost of Mr. Prendergast when he comes so out. So the uh, it's all the water, basically. Yeah, and that toilet and the, like, paper. And the like cubicle that. is kind of bending and stuff like that. That was quite cool scene, yeah, to be fair. Yeah, so yeah, there's definitely a lot of like, and I think the locations is, you know, a good one to pick up on as well, because to me, again, it shows the power of it being like physical and tangible is the, there's when they go to the graves, you know, there's the kind of sun is set in and in my head, I was kind of like, oh, that probably is literally a lamp or a light that they've put behind this kind of like canvas. And I like the fact that you could almost see that it was like, you know, when you, like in school and stuff and you take like a sponge and you like print on a, a painting i was like that pretty much looks like that you know so you're getting the kind of like realistic you know what i was saying earlier with armand that you know you can see the fingerprints element to it so i like that i think it adds like a charm to it and i think those kind of like orange colors and everything like that really work well within those locations yeah i also like the design of the you know the town like blythe hollow or whatever like all the the vintage like you know like which illustrations like the touristy aspect of it and like the witch statue as well yeah i thought it was good yeah i didn't feel that they were too on the nose with that sometimes they're a bit like other films can be very much like oh you know we love witches we have like witch fest every year or something like that i think that they played it a bit more like under the radar in terms of like it was just a thing aesthetically that you saw and then later on you saw how she obviously had a problem and how they kind of like put it into their kind of like vibe of the town but it wasn't kind of like shoved in your face uh, aspect the halloween reference as well i'm not surprised with jamie lee curtis because i think is it like the halloween theme is like his ringtone at one point or one of the yes. characters ringtones oh yeah and like when he looks out the window he has like the mask on his friend has yes. the mask on by like, the curtains and stuff yeah. yeah 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 there's a few jump scares and stuff like that i don't know like did you did you guys feel that there was like a lot of like do you think it was a scary film you know like i said we mentioned earlier for a kid's film it's quite you know like you're talking about children dying and things like that but i think those moments where they kind of say like when he's walking up after running over the zombie they kind of played this like do 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 you know sort of music whereas they didn't play like a tense music to kind of make you scared so i think they get away with stuff like that but there was still quite a few sort of jump scares and stuff for little kids it would be maybe a bit kind of scary yeah i think for a lot of kids they'll find this definitely sort of dark um and sort of difficult to deal with at times insofar as just a lot of the visuals 
for me, I didn't really get any of the sort of jump scares. No, I think I think it's like more kind of a reference to a jump scare rather than an actual jump scare. I think it's like there might have been one where like he went on the window of the van and there was maybe something like that, but or when he looked out that it's either that or you're just very, very <laughs> well, I didn't, scared. I didn't actually jump myself, but it's just the actual thing of like he went doom, you know, like and like when he cut to him outside of his window and stuff like that. So um yeah, I think it's like those moments that are kind of meant to make you jump, but there's not actually anything scary within it, etc. But yeah, I thought, you know, I appreciated that kind of inclusion of like showing those horror tropes, etc. And and yeah, just having dark imagery is the fact that, you know, later on, especially like when like the witch's hands, when she's like grabbing stuff and things are like the cracks are appearing and, you know, her entire face and the, you know, uh, the spikes like with the tree and stuff coming out when like Norman's trying to speak to her. There's a lot of stuff which is like very, you know, again, not scary, but it's just very dark imagery and very kind of intense, I guess. Right. So uh, that is uh, the facts of Paranorman. So uh, we'll wrap this up now by going to our final thoughts and anything else we want to mention about the film as we discuss whether it gains the honor of a place in our movie vault and join our prestigious collection of films that are to be highlighted for all time. So, uh, Nia, is there any other sort of like notes from the film or anything you'd like to mention? And what do you think about uh, it going into the movie vault? Nice. I don't have, think I have any um, other comments to say. Like, I enjoyed the film. It's not a perfect film, but I appreciate like what it you know, took to make it and the technological advances, you know, it helped push animation. They decided, you know, they wanted to tell like a different type of story. So um, I think it, I think it could, um, I'm ten, oh, conflicted. I would say that, yes, uh, put it in the vault mostly because what it did for animation um, and stop motion, it helped blend um, stop motion and 3D animation and the story as well. It's unique for a children's film. And I think it's an, an important sort of subject matter that we still need to discuss, you know, as human beings today. Um, so, yeah, I think it belongs in the vault. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, it kind of puts us in that tricky position because mm. we've had this before as well of like, again, talking about the quality of a film compared to Legacy, something like 28 Days Later, which was very much like, oh, you know, it did so much for the zombie genre and horror and this kind of resurgence. And the first half is so fantastic, but then it, you know, kind of, peters off a bit um, but we could still couldn't help but like reward that but even with something like avatar it was kind of like well yeah all of that is amazing in terms of what it's achieved technically but you know the story is still kind of has to blow you away and so in that circumstance it didn't so yeah it, it's it's a tricky one craig where, where do you come down on on its place in the movie vault i can't in good conscience say i want this in the movie vault I don't think I need to say anything more than that. I think while while its impact on sort of the industry is probably out there, um, it's arguable as to exactly how groundbreaking it necessarily is. I know it's obviously the first to use 3D printing, but this might be a very cynical view, but I'm unclear about how about how long it would have been for another film to basically pick up that process. It doesn't seem like... With other films that we've uh honored for what they've done in terms of filmmaking it did seem like a very out there sort of move whereas to me being the first to use 3d printing as well as the combination of of cgi just seems like something which was a bit of a net of an inevitability so for me it has less of an impact on that at which point i do have to look at the story and at the point where the story genuinely in terms of how it was executed in many areas made me feel uncomfortable yeah this this is like a no for me this isn't one of those ones where i'm just gonna plant my feet and say i will quit the show if it goes in but i'm uh so and i i will happily uh acknowledge if i get outvoted on this and it's a two to one it goes in um but i'm not That's voting okay. for it to go in yeah yeah i think though that is very true and i think that maybe even from what i saw with nia is that kind of maybe a, a agreement maybe is that for me that when you look at something even like you said i think the 3d printing and stuff is very specific area etc but I, st I still think that there'd be an element of like what it's doing for stop motion animation kind of having something that's not just aardman um and purveying these kind of like more grounded intense creepy stories etc 
and the way that they use technology. But then I, you know, I have to agree in the sense that I think the a, a better representation of that could possibly be Kubo or Missing Link or a, a later film, because it's the same with something like 2D animation, etc. It's the fact that you would look at Rescuers Down Under, which it was like, oh, that was like the first to kind of use this technique with the eagle and everything like that. But does it then make the entire film fantastic? Or would you sort of award something like Aladdin, which then had like the palace and, you know, the genie and all that kind of, which used that technology in a better way. So yes, while something like this is needed, so, you know, it's the whole paranormal walked. So, you know, uh, Kubo could run kind of element. Uh, but as we've mentioned before, you know, our vault doesn't mean that like it's deleted from existence either. So I love this preamble. You are basically just, you're walking a tightrope of which of these two am I, am I willing to just annoy? And you haven't quite made it yet. Well, yeah, I didn't have as much of a problem. I, I mentioned something like good dinosaur, which I was like, I do not like this message. I think with this, I really like loved the message but just thought that there were like problematic elements which i didn't like and just thought could have gone or could have been improved upon or just didn't enjoy but there was enough that i could kind of just ignore and look at the element of just like yeah while my some people might say that they're not sure about the way that it talks about bullying etc i thought it was just interesting the fact that it just went with this story of like are you, you know, you choose to be a good or a bad person, et cetera. And the fact that like Norman is just there, like, she's like, well, why don't you like make people pay for what, you know, you feel? And he's just like, because, you know, what is that going to do, et cetera. So I think that it has a fantastic sort of like final act. I think the visuals there really work and it's a really sort of touching story in that sense. Um, I, you know, liked some of the humor. I thought that the political commentary was amazing. The fact you mentioned, Nia, I think... I joked in my head about Mitch. I was just kind of like, oh, imagine if he was like, he had a boyfriend or something. And then when they did it, I was like, oh my God. I was like, I was shocked. I was, especially because again, now we're going through this whole thing with like Velma and Scooby-Doo and the fact that when Disney is there, like, oh, we have like an LGBT character in the background. People are like up in arms. I'm like, well, this film did it like years and years ago. Yeah, because it was a gag. Because it was a gag, right? Because it was literally just, ha ha. Oh, she spent all this time and he's gay. Oh. It just reminds me of like the Carly Rae Jepsen video where they basically pulled the same stick. But I don't think that necessarily was a gag against him though. So it was a funny in the sense of like, oh, she's been trying all this time and oh, like it turns out yeah, like it was I... fruitless. But it wasn't the sense that like it was like mean at him or anything. I think they still kind of said that like, yeah, this is cool that he is like that. And yeah, and like usually if you see, you know, like gay characters in film, it's like way over the top and exaggerated and stuff. And this was just, you know, sort of just as normal a character as, you know, anyone and stuff. So I appreciated that. Yeah, and and that yeah. they weren't too on the nose with it. The fact that earlier in the film yeah, yeah. he does that joke with the like, oh, baby, you okay? And then it's about the car. But you don't think then immediately like, oh, he must not be interested in her. It's just even that is a very like heterosexual thing that would happen with somebody who would just be more obsessed with the car than than the girl. But mm. yeah, even when I talk about those two characters, I think about like the physical elements of them the fact that like the sister you can see like the lip loss and the you know it shines and the the nails it all adds to like what i think is so great about the physical stop motion element of it mitch himself the fact he's just triangular in like his shape i just find hilarious the fact his waist is so tiny and like even like earlier on when he like comes out of the shower or whatever i was like you don't often see animated characters with nipples like it's the fact that they went there <laughs> um so yeah I, I find that funny and that that's why i'm kind of like willing to enjoy the film more for those like visual nuances etc but ultimately I do have to agree that I don't think it's enough of a game changer. I don't think the story as a whole is strong enough for it to make it into the movie vault this time. But either way, we've had a fun time. But unfortunately, I think not into the movie vault for Paranorman. But hopefully Nia will have something on the animated catalog that uh, will go in soon. That's all right. I'll keep it. I'll keep this for myself. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll definitely be watching it again <laughs> myself as well, because, yeah, I, I had a fun time. And uh, I so. have deleted the video that David sent me. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, end game time. So quite aptly, I think this game is called The Scariest Thing of All, Other People's Opinions. 
So what I decided to do, uh, very much because this is obviously um, like well known to those, uh, ironically, who know it uh, as being sort of groundbreaking in uh, insofar as uh, how much horror it's willing to bring uh, to like children's animation specifically. I decided to look up uh, on the very respected website Rotten Tomatoes uh, or Tomatoes, depending on your persuasion. Um, as to what exactly they would consider to be the scariest uh, kids films out there involving animation. Uh, so what I've done is I have found their list where they've had uh, like the 10 film, uh, 10 animated films or films that include a significant amount of animation. You'll understand why I've put that caveat in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you those 10 films and I want you to work out what order they come insofar as they're as their rating on the freshometer. So that is their rating uh, professionally. In the event that two films have the same uh, same percentage, uh, the tie break will then be its audience vote. Okay? Does uh, Is everyone clear on the rules? So this will be a David versus Nia game. Uh, and as always, the opportunity to choose our next film to discuss on the, on the podcast is up for grabs. So are we both comfortable with the rules? So are we just ordering the films? Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll post them in the Zoom chat. Okay, okay. Uh, and then basically I want you to send oh, and- send them back to me privately and then we'll go for each position one by one. And if you get it if you get the film's position on this like top 10 correct, you get a point. Um I may do bonus points if you want to try and guess what percentage you think it got. Okay. Where does the audience percentage If it's a tie break. So if there are like two films that have, say, for whatever reason, like 86%, uh, whichever has the highest audience percentage on top of that Mm. will be ranked one position higher. Okay. Okay. Is it from most scariest to Uh, least scariest? So we're going to go from uh, least to most. But I mean, obviously this is like the most scary. So this will be like the the 10th 10th to 1st but are they actually is the list actually in terms of like the freshest goes at the top that, or that is, is literally like the, what i just matter. said the freshest goes at the top this might not necessarily be what is the scariest this is a group of the scariest but this is just then what is the best on top of it so before we get into the actual game let's have a feeler for what films we're playing for for next time so david give us an inkling of what the final halloween based episode for this year will be if you were to win or to be chosen. So um, my film I have gone for is just a year later. So I guess in terms of the chain, we're just uh, going a short time span. And uh, this film that we've been discussing today, Paranorman, is obviously linked to witchcraft and kind of like curses and all of that kind of stuff. And this film is kind of famous within the past few years of being one of the strongest in the horror genre for like successfully pulling this off and having quite a lot of spin-offs that have come from it so yeah 2013 and a kind of scary horror i think for a lot of people um which i think would be interesting to discuss at the end of this month i i have a fair idea of what you may have chosen nia what will you be advocating for Nice. Well, mine is mostly related on the Halloween front, um, and it's not from recently. It's uh, the late 1980s, um, and it's a cult classic, and that's all I will say. Okay, fantastic. So we basically have a coven versus a cult in today's, <laughs> yes. today's endgame. So the 10 films that are included in the Rotten Tomatoes Top 10 Scariest Animated Films for Kids... We have, and these are all posted in alphabetical order, so just to make sure there's no inkling of what they could be. The films we are discussing, Coraline, Monster House, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, Spirited Away, The Great Mouse Detective, The Last Unicorn, The Nightmare Before Christmas, The Secret of Nim, Watership Down, and for the caveat I gave earlier, who framed Roger Rabbit? Okay, so what I want you to do is, like I said, uh, give us your own ordering where you will say what you think was ranked 10th in terms of their popularity with critics, going up to first, 
And if you get it right, you get a point. So this is one of those rare occasions for the uh, listeners at home where I get to just talk to you um, and just see how you're doing. How are you? I know you can't respond to me, but you can respond to me in spirit. I think if there's one thing I've demonstrated so far on the podcast is I feel a lot and I feel like I can feel your pain. If you want to send me your pain, go for it. So, let's get started then. So, for number 10, Nia, what do you think ranked 10th on their list? I put the Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. <laughs> You've gone for Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. David, what did you go for? Um, I went for Monster House. Mm, I was thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, a bit harsh to Scooby-Doo. Sorry. Any, <laughs> Sorry, did Monster anyone House. have any feelings of why they went for their particular films? I still like the Scooby-Doo one. I still like, she's not good. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I think to me, just Monster House just seems like the least well remembered of all of these films. Okay. So. I mean, that's ironic because there's only one film on this uh, list I've never heard of, and that is the film in 10th. So both of you are. Whoa. Oh. The correct answer is The Last Unicorn. Mm. Oh, no. RIP. The Last Unicorn scored an overall critic score of 73%. Oh, so we're out like we're. Not even in like sixty nope. territory. Very, uh, very much yet. So seventy three, and I will happily say that the uh, the top answer has a score of ninety seven percent. Okay, so let's go to number nine, David. What did you go for this time? Well, I know this is wrong. The last unicorn. You went for the last unicorn, and Nia. I went for Monster House. Uh, <laughs> so David, unfortunately, you are. But Nia... Nice, nice, oh. nice. Monster House got 75%. So literally, David, you just had to get one more, one or two more critics on your side and you could have gotten a score rever- uh. reversal. Okay, so number eight, Nia. I put The Secret of Nim. You've gone for The Secret of Nim. Okay, and David? Uh, this is where I put Scooby Doo on Zombie Island because again, I just I can't imagine it would be like highly praised, but I just know that there's still a you know fan okay. base for it. So, so is it the secret of Nim? Is it Scooby Doo on Zombie Island? Mm. It's well, Scooby Doo. It's the well. Great <laughs> Mouse Detective. Oh. So it scored 79%, but then it's in a tie break with another film. So it's went to the audience score and the audience score for the film is 78%. So the next film um. also has 79%, but an audience score of 86%. David, what do you think our seventh film is? Uh, this one, I put The Secret of Nim. The Secret of Nim. And Nia, what did you go for? This one's the wrong one, the last unicorn. Are you ever the, oh, so we already know that that's... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, is it the secret of Nim? Oh. It's Watership Down. Oh, oh wow. Oh. And this happened so again. So, were you expecting that to be much, much higher, David? Uh, no, as you will ah, soon find so out. So, let me guess, your number six... <laughs> is Watership Down. So, Nia, what did you go for? And this one, uh, again, the Great Mouse Detective. Oh. That's not right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If this was most scary, then well, that would be a lot higher because that end yeah. scene with Rattigan is terrifying. So, I mean, you finally found it. This is where Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is. Oh. All right. <laughs> uh, and you're not going to believe how much of a jump from 79 we've gone to. It has a critic score of 88 percent what <laughs> wow okay i was thinking in my head i was like oh maybe it's just skimmed, s- skimmed an 81 or an 83 but yeah wow, no 88 okay. which means every film we've got left is in the 90s Jeez. so nia what do you think our fifth best of these scary films is oh uh, this one's wrong uh i put watership down ah, unfortunate mm. david what did you go for uh the fifth uh this is wrong uh, great mouse detective <laughs> I feel this is also going to upset one of you in particular. Uh, this is Coraline. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, 90%. I knew it was high with yeah. that one. But so yeah. we've got to the halfway mark and so far one point has been scored. 
<laughs> David, you, you, <laughs> one of those. you need a, a lot to happen. And I don't think it's going to happen with this next one. We come to number four. David, what did you go for? Uh, so um, I'm trying to work out whether... What do you mean trying to work out? You sent me your answers. No, just be, the no based on the placement of Coraline, whether I was just like, oh, how disappointing is this going to be? But yeah, I I sort of like begrudgingly put The Nightmare Before Christmas just because I felt everything would have been higher above it. So, so you've gone for The Nightmare Before Christmas for number four. Okay, and Nia, yes. what did you go for? I went for Spirited Away. Okay, so is it The Nightmare Before Christmas? Is it Spirited Away? You finally found it. It's the secret of Nim. Oh. Oh wow. See, I knew it was Don Bluth. I knew it was very much liked, but I didn't think that. The secret of Nim got ninety three percent. Oh. Wow. Okay, so Nia, for number three, what did you go for? I put the nightmare before Christmas. And David? No, it's wrong. Coraline. So the question is: Is it the nightmare before Christmas? Oh. Yep. Uh, <laughs> 90... There's so many times where it's like we've been like changed on four and three and eight and nine and Nia's just got the right way percent Nice. Uh, okay, so now we come to number two. David, what did you go for? I went for Who Framed Roger Rabbit because, again, it was really a toss-up between these two, but I was the two top ones, but I thought, well, one of them is an Oscar winner. And Nia? I also picked Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And you are both... Yay, yeah, 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 I have a point. <laughs> you have a point. Unfortunately, mathematically, you cannot win. <laughs> because we have one <laughs> left, and we already know what that number one is. So, just to go for it, David, what is the number one? Spirited Away. Damn. Yep. Uh, Nia, your number one was Coraline, which you was. already we already know is unfortunately yes. not right. It was like five or something. I was tempted to go for that. I think it was like, because in your head, you kind of like, that's almost the one you want to go to as most scary. But then I was like, I know that this is loved, but again, Spirited Away, Oscar winning. Mm. So I thought that this but must be the, the highest thing rated. Is, critically, they were both uh, 97%. It came down to audience oh. vote. Wow. So okay, the then. audience the audience vote for Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Rabbit was what I think is surprisingly low for the film. It was 85% and Spirited Away was 96%. Mm. But in the end, with a final score of three to two, the winner is Nia. Yes. Congratulations on winning <laughs> the end game. Thank you. So the decision is yours. Would you like to go with the film that you've suggested for us or would you like to go with David's suggestion? The choice uh, is very much yours. I don't yours. know. I see. I don't know his suggestion. You don't suggestion. know his choice. Mm. So it's a case of were you persuaded by his description of the film or mm. do you just want to go with your suggestion? I'm going to go with my suggestion because I think everyone will have a nice time. Okay, fantastic. So tell us now. <laughs> what Craig will have a nice time. <laughs> I, I have decided to pick Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice! From the director of Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Adam and Barbara are... Ghosts. What's the good of being a ghost if you can't frighten people away? Their house is being haunted by the living. Maybe the house could use a little remodeling. And they can't scare them into leaving. They're dead. It's a little late to be neurotic. So they're calling on Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice! 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 Who's no ordinary ghost. Yeah, you don't want his help. Can you be scary? What do you think of this? Now, the party's over. You want somebody out of the house? I want to get somebody out of your house. <laughs> but the fun has just begun. It's showtime. Learn to throw your voice, fool your friends, butter party. Not bad. <laughs> This is amazing. You want a cigarette? Oh, no, thank you. Oh, yeah, here I come, baby. He's guaranteed to put some life... Attention, King Workshoppers. ...in your afterlife. Michael Keaton is Beetlejuice. I'm the ghost with the most, babe. Fantastic. The ever energetic Beetlejuice. Yes, cult so, classic. 
It is a cult classic. This is also, yet again, one of those films I probably should have seen, but have not seen. So... And another time the Craig is going to have to begrudgingly watch Tim Burton. I'm not a fan <laughs> of Tim Yeah, but Burton. this isn't, like, typical Tim... No. This isn't typical Tim Burton, right? This is, like... No. you got enough Michael Keaton yeah, there this to is kind a of, lot of satisfy. Fun. It's yeah, good. this is it's good. this is entertainment as opposed to the other Tim Burton you tried to get me to watch before, which is, like, trying to be emotional and schmaltzy, and I just don't do that stuff again. <laughs> <for me. laughs> so, for the listeners at home who want to watch the film along with us as we discuss it in the next episode, David, where can they watch Beetlejuice? So, Beetlejuice, you can watch uh, as a part of your subscription over on Amazon Prime at the moment. Obviously, keep an eye on that. Sometimes they're quite bad for being like, oh, it's only here for three more days. Uh, But I'm assuming that they'll keep it there for Halloween. So, yeah, Amazon Prime, uh, you can catch it at the moment. Uh, If you are subscribed to like Virgin Media's service, then it's also part of a subscription there. Um, And apart from that, then it's your kind of usual rental outlets if you're looking at... uh, digitally watching it so whether it be apple tv amazon sky google play and then if you're looking at watching it physically then uh yeah of course you can catch it on dvd blu-ray i think there's a four yeah there is a 4k release of it out there as well uh so yeah lots of places to go and uh, catch beetlejuice awesome well yeah that's uh that was a very fun end game there try lots of like just so many close calls <laughs> <laughs> just like just literally the difference between three and two and eight and nine and uh yeah, well done, Nia, on uh, just being correct on some of the placements of those ones. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we had a very fun discussion today uh, talking all about Paranorman. Nia, uh, for yourself, where can the people at home uh, catch you? What are some of the projects you got coming up? And uh, where, where can people find you on social media? Yes, awesome. So I'm on both Twitter and Instagram at aloofness. That's A-L-O-O-F-N-E-S-S aloofness um or if, if that if you somehow don't get that just search me all of these lists you can find me on there and i'll be making some announcements soon on like some awesome projects that are in the pipeline but yeah as i mentioned i'm doing a lot of stuff with film cymru um yeah awesome yeah we look forward to it. definitely some exciting stuff coming up and uh, yeah i'm sure we can uh, already see some of the the animated stuff uh, you've been working on etc yes. so it's gonna be gonna be good so uh yeah uh, a shout out from ourselves as well uh, just like last time uh, we had the very talented Kyle Sean Thomas provide our intro for today's episode to give us that sort of spooky uh, intro which was probably better than me going boo uh, so if you want to uh, catch Kyle then you can catch him on social media Kyle Sean Thomas but also his band which is Crypt Rot uh, which has an album coming out called An Ancient Summoning which is very apt for what we've been talking uh, about today so you can catch that uh, band uh, on social media as well catch them over on uh, instagram uh, the instagram handle is crypt rot band so that's rot r-o-t uh, so go check kyle out and his band and yeah as a heavy metal or so screamo band then it's very monster <laughs> horror vibes which kind of fits with what we've been talking about as well so yeah, uh, anything lastly from yourself, Craig? Only if you enjoy this endgame to make sure to look out for our upcoming endgame special at the end of the year. Uh, we've physically started production on it, as in we've started writing some of the games, coming up with brand new uh, ways to uh, to trick our contestants and generally, you know, put them to the test, put them to the challenge. As a previous endgame episode contender in the year is getting the flashbacks now she's like oh my god yeah no, I know what that, don't take what me that. back <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah well uh thank you everyone at home for uh, checking out this episode so do go watch beetlejuice uh from tim burton starring michael keaton which yeah perfect fun halloween movie i'm really hoping that that leads somewhere else as well in terms of like the trade of movies uh, for later in the year and yeah We'll uh, catch you on the next one. Thank you for joining us in our conversation of Paranorman. Let us know what you would like to see discussed in the future. Do you think Paranorman should have made it into the movie vault? And uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.